pump overhaul is a big job. The process of rebuilding or replacing parts so that the pump works like new again takes skill and practice. But centrifugal pumps are similar enough that the overhaul procedures we'll see in this segment can apply to almost all of them. However, there are exceptions. And I'm sure you'll find that the pumps you work on won't be exactly the same size and shape as this one. But by and large, the steps we'll follow in overhauling this pump will be the same steps you'll follow on most all split casing centrifugal pumps. A pump overhaul begins the same way work on all mechanical equipment begins, with careful preparation. This preparation includes three steps. Consulting the manufacturer's instruction manual, following plant safety precautions that apply, and tagging out the equipment before beginning work. The manufacturer's instruction manual lists the parts and special tools you'll need. It also gives you the specifications of the pump and any special instructions you should know about. Your plant's safety procedures help you do the job in a way that's safe for you, for other workers, and for the plant itself. Be sure to follow precautions listed for both the equipment and the area you're working in. Tagging procedures are designed to prevent anyone from turning the equipment on while you're working on it. Tags alert everyone to the fact that the system has been deactivated for a reason and should not be activated again until the tags are removed. We tagged out this pump before we brought it into the shop. We also removed all gauges, piping, nipples, and other fixtures that could get damaged. And once we removed the pump from its bed plate, we cleaned the casing thoroughly using clean rags, a non-toxic, non-flammable solvent, and a soft bristle brush. If the pump were small enough, we could have simply dipped it in the solvent. But whether you scrub or dip the pump, the idea is to get the casing as clean as necessary to provide free access to studs, nuts and bolts, and other disassembly points. During cleaning, be sure to avoid breathing solvent fumes. Always work in a well-ventilated area, because even non-toxic solvents give off fumes that can be harmful. We can now begin disassembly by removing the gland followers. Leak off usually causes rust to build up here, so the gland follower and the follower bolts should be thoroughly sprayed with penetrating oil. Then a wrench can be used to free the bolts so that the gland follower can be removed. In some cases, the bolts can be backed off most of the way by hand and swung to the side, freeing the gland follower completely. If the gland follower is split, its halves can be separated and removed from the shaft. They should be put back together and placed in the pan used to hold the pump parts. This procedure is repeated for the gland follower on the other side of the pump. If the casing halves have not previously been marked, use a hammer and a center punch or other pointed tool to make witness marks on both the upper and lower casing halves. Witness marks will help you to align the casing properly when you reassemble the pump later. With the witness marks made, begin loosening the casing flange bolts with a wrench. When all the bolts have been loosened, you can use a speed wrench to remove them. Also remove the gland follower bolts and casing dowel pins and place them in the parts pan. Once all the casing flange bolts have been removed, you can lift off the upper half of the casing. When you set the casing down, it's important that you turn it so the flange doesn't get dented or scratched on the surface of the table. In the next segment, we'll look at how to remove the internal parts from the casing. We'll also inspect the internal parts for signs of wear or damage. But before we do, let's take a break to review the material we've covered so far. We concluded the last segment by removing the upper casing half. Now we can make a preliminary inspection of the casing and the internal parts. 
Then we'll go on to removing, cleaning, and thoroughly inspecting these parts. Begin by inspecting all the internal surfaces of the casing. Feel for rough and pitted spots where the casing wearing rings fit against the casing and check the volute for signs of cavitation. Don't forget the surfaces of the stuffing boxes and the discharge ports. These areas are also subject to wear and erosion. Next, do a preliminary inspection of the internal parts. Start with the impeller. Look for erosion or pitting at the tips of the vanes and around the edge of the shrouds. Rotate the impeller a couple of times so that you don't miss any hidden signs of trouble, particularly around the outside surface of the shrouds. Then check the fit of the casing wearing rings, and as a quick check on the bearings, see if the shaft rotates smoothly without any drag or uneven motion. After this preliminary inspection of the casing, the impeller, the casing wearing rings, and the bearings, make the necessary preparations for removing the rotor from the lower casing. This means having a pair of V-blocks set up and ready to receive the rotor once it's removed. Now, free the bearing housing from the casing by first removing the dowel pins or other alignment devices and the bearing housing bolts. As with all the other parts of the pump, the dowel pins and bearing housing bolts should be set in a pan where you can easily find them for reassembly. You can now carefully lift the rotor out of the lower casing. Set it in place on the V-blocks so the internal parts are suspended above the surface of the table. When overhauling large pumps, be certain that the V-blocks you use can support the rotor. Otherwise, V-blocks could break, dropping the rotor on the floor. With the lower casing exposed, remove the shims from the pedestals that support the two bearing housings. Because these shims are necessary for proper bearing alignment, each set should be taped together and properly marked using one of the methods found in the text or suggested by your instructor. Labeling the shims guarantees that you'll be able to put them back in their original position when you reassemble the pump. A putty knife or other thin bladed tool should be used to scrape the gasket off the casing flanges. Use caution to avoid damaging the flange surfaces. Most of the time the gasket won't come off in one piece. It'll probably take some time and elbow grease to scrape the surface down to bare metal. But it's an important step, so take whatever time is needed to clean the casing thoroughly. When you're done with the casing, start disassembly of the rotor. Remove the rings of old packing material and inspect each one. If any of the rings are stiff, scorched, or shredded, this usually means that the gland was not properly lubricated. The gland follower could have been adjusted too tightly or the gland sealing line might be blocked. Both of these possible causes must be checked before reassembling the pump later on. Also, check the surface of the shaft for grooves and ridges worn into it by packing rings that weren't properly lubricated. Ridges like the ones you see on this shaft should be reported to your supervisor. When you finish inspecting the shaft, Make a preliminary check of the casing wearing ring clearance. With the ring in place against the impeller, insert a feeler gauge into the space between them. It usually takes a couple of tries to get a combination of blades to fit snugly into the gap. Also, notice how much this casing wearing ring shifts up and down whenever the mechanic touches it. This is a pretty sure sign that the gap is too wide. In any case, compare the measurement you take with the recommended clearance in the manufacturer's instruction manual. After the preliminary inspections we've just seen, that is the inspection of the shaft and the clearance of the casing wearing rings, it's time to remove the internal parts from the shaft. 
This will, will enable you to thoroughly clean these parts and make a detailed inspection of signs of wear or damage. Since the flingers, lantern rings, throat bushings, and impeller assembly can't be removed until the coupling hub and bearings are out of the way, we'll deal with the hub and the bearings first. A gear puller can be used to remove the coupling hub. Be certain the gear puller is properly aligned before exerting pressure on the hub. And don't forget to remove the key and the seal from the shaft. Once the hub is off, you're ready to remove the inboard bearing. That is the bearing closest to the motor during operation. To do this, you must first take off the bearing flinger. This one is held in place by a set screw. When the flinger is loose, slide it off the end of the shaft. Next, loosen the set screw in the flinger on the other side of the bearing. Moving the flinger away from the bearing housing will give you enough room later on to set the rotor in the arbor press. With the flinger out of the way, you can remove the end plate on the bearing housing. This end plate is held in place by four screws. As always, keep these screws together in one place after you remove them. If the end plate can't be pulled off by hand, tap it gently with a soft-faced hammer until it comes free. You should know that dirt and grit can easily ruin an otherwise perfect bearing. So don't simply put the parts of the bearing assembly with the other parts of the pump. Instead, protect them by setting them on a clean rag. You can now slide the bearing housing back out of the way to expose the retaining nut, the lock washer, and the bearing itself. To see what you're doing with the nut and the washer, use another clean rag to remove as much excess grease as possible. Then rotate the shaft until you find the place where one ear of the lock washer has been folded into the retaining nut. Use a drift punch and a hammer to fold the ear back and out of the groove. Then use either a spanner wrench or other tool supplied by the manufacturer to back the retaining nut off. Be certain to check the direction of the threads before applying force on the nut. If you find that you have to tap the handle of the wrench to break the nut free, have someone hold the rotor steady so that it doesn't rotate while you're working. When the nut comes loose, simply back it off its threads and remove it and the lock washer from the shaft. Again, use a clean rag to wipe the bearing lubricant off the shaft and the bearing. If there's a spacer that fits between the lock washer and the bearing itself, slide it off the end of the shaft and set it aside. You're now ready to take the rotor to the arbor press to remove the bearing. It's helpful to have some assistance in lining up the shaft in the press. The bearing itself will rest on supports, which should be positioned right up against the shaft. In this way, the shaft will drop away from the bearing when pressure is applied. Put a protective cap on the end of the shaft to protect it from damage. And don't forget your safety goggles. Now use the hydraulic controls to lower the piston onto the end of the shaft. It usually doesn't take very much pressure to press off the bearing. So once the piston is in contact with the end of the shaft, ease it down. When the bearing breaks free, the shaft will drop straight down, leaving the bearing in place on the supports. To protect the shaft from damage when it drops, be sure the floor under the press is thickly cushioned. 
Now that the bearing has been pressed off, you can take the rotor and the bearing back to the work area to complete the disassembly procedure. Continue disassembly by removing the other internal parts on the inboard side of the impeller. First, slide the bearing housing off the end of the shaft, followed by the flinger, and then the lantern ring and throat bushing. Okay, the next step is to remove the casing wearing ring. But before you do, make sure you mark both the ring and the hub of the impeller. The casing wearing rings are not interchangeable. Each one must later be put back on the same side of the impeller it came from. The only part remaining on this side of the impeller is the impeller retaining nut. Since the retaining nut threads on the shaft are subject to stress when the pump is running, both nuts will have to be removed so you can inspect the threads carefully. Remove the inboard nut by first loosening and removing the set screw. Then use a spanner wrench to back the nut off the shaft. Make sure you keep the heel of the wrench away from the set screw hole so as not to damage the threads inside. And of course, make sure you know which way the threads run. When the nut is loose, back it off the shaft and put it with the rest of the parts. This completes disassembly of one side of the impeller. To remove the bearing and the parts of the gland follower from the other end of the shaft, simply repeat the procedures we just saw, beginning with the disassembly of the bearing housing. However, if you have to remove the impeller from the shaft, as we do, there's one important step you must take. Before removing the second retaining nut, measure the distance from the shoulder of the nut to the end of the shaft. This way, you'll be able to replace the nut in the same position later. You can then use this nut as a guide for correctly positioning the impeller back on the shaft. When all the other parts have been removed from the rotor, the impeller can either be pressed off in an arbor press or removed with a puller. In either way, be very careful not to damage it. With the shaft completely stripped, and all the parts laid out in the order in which you remove them, you can begin a thorough inspection. Start with the parts of the packing glands. Are the lantern rings in good condition? Is the channel inside each ring clear? Are the holes in the sides of the channel clean and free of obstruction? Are the throat bushings in good condition? Or do they show signs of erosion? And how about the stuffing box in the lower casing? Does it show any signs of pitting or corrosion? The inside surfaces should be clean and smooth. If necessary, use a wire brush to clean the walls of the stuffing box down to bare metal. Another thing to check is the inside surface of the volute. Be sure there are no signs of cavitation or other damage. Then. Insert a wire into the slop drain holes and any drain piping to be certain that these flow paths are open. Since the flingers are exposed to water during operation, you'll probably find that rust has built up on their outside surfaces. This calls for a wire brush and a good thorough cleaning. The best way to inspect the bearings is to rotate each one around your finger, as you see here. This bearing is obviously warped. In addition, the outside surface shows dark spots, which are usually signs of uneven stress. This lock washer is also damaged. You can see that several teeth are missing. 
There's only one place for parts in this condition, the trash. Next, clean the other parts of the bearing assemblies. A non-flammable, non-toxic solvent and a soft bristle brush are best for this purpose. If the bearing we saw had passed our preliminary inspection, it would have to be cleaned also to be sure it was free of dirt and old lubricant. There are only three parts of the pump that we haven't thoroughly inspected yet. The casing wearing rings, the impeller, and the shaft. But before we look at these parts, turn off the tape and take a short break. In the last segment, we completely disassembled the pump and cleaned and inspected most of the parts. In this segment, we'll take a close look at inspection procedures for the casing wearing rings, the impeller, and the shaft. We'll also spend some time checking the clearance between the casing wearing rings and the impeller. Let's begin with the shaft. In a thorough shaft inspection, there are two important things to look for. One is whether or not the shaft is bent. And the second is whether or not the surface of the shaft is marred by gouges, ridges, cracks, or other damage. With the shaft suspended on the blocks, mount a dial indicator so that its stem presses against the shaft. Set the reading on the indicator to zero. Then slowly rotate the shaft. Any change in reading tells you that the shaft is bent or otherwise out of round and must be replaced. You can also see that ridges have been worn into the shaft by poorly lubricated packing material. Another good reason to double check the gland sealing line and the parts of the gland itself. You should also check the shaft for tiny cracks and other signs of stress. And take a close look at the area around the impeller retaining nut thread and the shaft keyway. Now you'll have to decide whether or not any damage you find is serious enough to call for a new shaft. Now when you inspect the impeller, concentrate on the outside edges, the tip of the veins, and the suction eye. Check the space between the shrouds for accumulations of material that could block the flow of water through the impeller. If the suction eye or some other part of the flow path is blocked, clear the blockage before putting the impeller back into the pump. Next, the casing wearing rings should be inspected. Remember that these rings seal off the discharge from the suction, a job they can't do well if they're severely worn. So, inspect the inside surface for signs of pitting or other corrosion. But even if the casing wearing rings look like they're in good condition, you can't be sure until you measure the casing wearing ring clearances. To understand exactly what casing wearing ring clearance is, take a look at this drawing. This is the impeller, and this is the casing. As you can see, the casing wearing ring here fits around the hub or shoulder of the impeller to fill the gap between the casing and the impeller. But the casing wearing ring and the impeller did not actually touch. If they did, the spinning impeller would rub against the ring, causing damage to both parts. But the space or clearance between the ring and the impeller must be as small as possible to block leakage from the discharge back into the suction eye. To find out whether the clearance between these parts is within manufacturer's specifications, measure the inside diameter of the ring and then the outside diameter of the impeller hub. The difference between these measurements is the actual wearing ring clearance. Begin by measuring the inside diameter of one of the casing wearing rings with a telescoping gauge. Be certain to measure at the widest part of the ring. Then use an outside micrometer to take a reading on the gauge itself. Don't be in a hurry when you're doing this. Take your time to be certain that all your measurements are accurate. Inaccurate measurements 
can result in replacing a ring that's still in good condition or leaving a worn ring in service only to cause problems later. Repeat this procedure at several points around the inside diameter of the ring. If all the measurements are identical, you'll know that the ring is perfectly round. If the measurements are different from one another, the casing wearing ring is not round and must be replaced. Be sure to write your measurements down. This not only gives you a record of your measurements, but also makes it easier to do the calculations that we'll have to do shortly. Next, use the outside micrometer to measure the hub of the impeller that corresponds to the ring you just measured. Once a pair of casing wearing rings is put into service, they wear at different rates. As a result, they're not interchangeable. The marks you made earlier on one ring and the hub it came from will keep you from mixing them up. Repeat your measurements at several places around the impeller hub. If these measurements match, the hub is round. If they don't match, the hub is not round, and this out of roundness will have to be corrected. Again, write the measurements down, both to give you a written record and to make your calculations easier. When the casing wearing ring and the impeller hub on one side have been measured, repeat the procedure for the ring and the hub on the other side. When you're done, you'll end up with four measurements. Since we now know the measurements of both rings and both hubs, all we have to do to determine the casing wearing ring clearance is to subtract the measurement of the hub from the measurement of the ring, first on one side of the impeller and then on the other. When you've subtracted your measurements correctly and double-checked them to be certain they're accurate, compare them to the clearance specified in the manufacturer's instruction manual. If the clearances are within the manufacturer's specs, the rings and the impeller can be put back into service. If the clearance is too large, however, the casing wearing rings and the impeller may have to be replaced. In the pump we're overhauling, the clearance on both sides of the impeller is too large. So we'll be replacing both the wearing rings and the impeller when we reassemble the pump in the next segment. Okay, that completes our inspection of the pump parts. We've inspected the casings, the bearings, the parts of the packing gland, the impeller, and the shaft. We've also checked the casing wearing ring clearance. You'll remember that we found that one of the bearings was damaged, the shaft was bent, and the casing wearing rings and impeller have to be replaced to return the clearance to specifications. Now that we know what new parts we need, we can go ahead and order them, using the specs and ordering numbers listed in the manufacturer's instruction manual. While we're waiting for replacement parts to arrive, Turn off the tape and review the material we've covered in this segment. After you've torn the pump down, inspected and cleaned all its parts, and received the replacement parts that you need, you're faced with the job of reassembling the unit. Remember that the way you put the pump back together determines how successful your overhaul is and how well the equipment will run when it's put back into service. Because proper reassembly is so important, let me give you three rules to follow. First, be certain that every part you install is in top condition. This means new parts as well as old ones. Just because a part comes right out of the manufacturer's package doesn't mean that it's automatically fit for service. New parts should be inspected just as carefully as old ones. Second, be sure that all parts that require lubrication, such as the bearings, are properly lubricated. Forgetting to lubricate a part or lubricating a part incorrectly will almost surely cause failure of the part. And third, 
Position each part carefully so that it's exactly where it's supposed to be. Don't forget to pay attention to any witness marks that you made. By following these practices for any piece of equipment that you disassemble, you'll find the reassembly procedure goes much easier. If at any time, when you're not sure of where a part belongs or whether or not it should be lubricated, consult the manufacturer's instruction manual. The few minutes it takes to look up the answer will save you hours of taking the pump apart again to correct any wrong guesses that you made. Okay, so keeping these three rules in mind, let's put, put this pump back together. The starting point for reassembly is the shaft. Since the shaft that came out of this pump was bent, we have to install a new one. But before we do, we have to follow our first rule by being sure the new shaft is in good condition. To do this, we can use the V-blocks on the dial indicator, just as we did when inspecting the old shaft. It sometimes helps to lubricate the V-blocks so that the shaft will be able to rotate smoothly and evenly. Then set the shaft in place and mount the dial indicator so that its stem presses against a point on one end of the shaft. Set the dial indicator to zero and slowly rotate the shaft. While you're doing this, keep your eye on the indicator needle. If the needle moves, the shaft is out of round and can't be used. Repeat this procedure at a point on the other end of the shaft. For the shaft to be in good condition, the reading on the dial indicator should not fluctuate at any point. If the shaft passes inspection, the next step is to lubricate one set of retaining nut threads with a lubricant recommended by the manufacturer. You can then slip the nut on the end of the shaft and turn it into position. Remember that this retaining nut acts as a guide for positioning the impeller, so you must be sure to move it to the same position it was in on the old shaft. Do this by measuring the distance from the shoulder of the nut to the end of the shaft. When this measurement matches the one you took during the disassembly procedure, the nut is in the proper position. Using the retaining nut as a guide, you can now mount the impeller on the shaft. Begin by taking a blob of grease on the tip of your finger and smearing it into the keyway. This grease will hold the key in place and keep it from falling out while you're positioning the impeller. Insert the key in the keyway, being sure that the grease holds it in place. Then coat the surface of the shaft where the impeller will be mounted with the same lubricant that you used on the retaining nut threads. This lubricant reduces friction between the impeller and the shaft, preventing damage to both parts and making the job easier. When you put the impeller on the shaft, Remember that the vanes must rotate in the proper direction. If you're not sure which direction they go, consult the instruction manual for the correct procedure. With the impeller loosely in position, set the rotor in the arbor press with the impeller resting on its supports. The retaining nut must be located above the impeller. As we mentioned during disassembly, always place a protective cap or a center finder on the end of the shaft to protect it. Don't forget to protect your eyes also by wearing your safety goggles. When you're satisfied that everything is properly lined up, turn on the press and lower the piston onto the protective cap or the center finder. It doesn't take a lot of pressure to force the shaft down through the impeller, so take it easy. And as the retaining nut gets near the impeller, keep a close watch on the pressure gauge. As soon as the needle jumps, stop the press. The increase in pressure indicates that the retaining nut is touching the impeller.
When the piston rises out of the way, you can remove the center finder from the end of the shaft and take the shaft and the impeller out of the press. Now you can return to the work area and mount the other parts of the rotor on the shaft. Before you replace any of the other internal parts on the rotor, there are two important measurements that must be made. One is a measurement of the distance from the hub of the impeller to the end of the shaft. The impeller must be in the proper position in order to fit into the lower casing. The second measurement you must take are those for the new casing wearing ring clearance. Remember that we're installing new casing wearing rings. And what does our first reassembly rule say? Right. All parts, old or new, must be checked to be sure they're in good condition. Both the inside diameter of each of the rings and the outside diameter of each impeller hub should be carefully measured. If the two clearances are within the manufacturer's specifications, you can mount both rings. Then lubricate the threads for the second retaining nut and slide it onto the shaft. When you've hand tightened the nut as far as it will go, use a spanner wrench or other appropriate tool to tighten it into position. Tapping the handle lightly with a small hammer should lock the nut into place. You can now slide the other parts onto the shaft. Working outward from the impeller retaining nut are the throat bushing, the lantern ring, the flinger, and the bearing housing. Next are the bearings themselves. Remember that thorough lubrication of the bearings is essential. As always, use only lubricants recommended by the manufacturer. Pack the lubricant into the first of the two outboard bearings by rolling it across your hands. Force as much lubricant as possible between the races. When it's fully lubricated, slide it onto the end of the shaft. Lubricate the second bearing in the same way, forcing as much lubricant as possible between the races. Make sure that all air spaces are filled with lubricant. When it's thoroughly lubricated, put it aside on a clean cloth. This way it will be protected until you're ready to press it into position. When pressing the bearing into position, you'll probably need someone to hold the rotor steady. One method for installing bearings is to use a section of pipe and a small hammer to tap them into place. It's extremely important that the pipe fit against the inside race and not the outside race. Otherwise, you'll likely ruin the bearing. Tap the pipe only hard enough to move the bearing, stopping when it's seated against the ridge on the shaft. Repeat this procedure for the second bearing. Tap it until it's seated against the first bearing. With the excess grease wiped off, slide the lock washer onto the shaft so that it fits snugly against the bearings. This is followed by the retaining nut that fits onto the threads at the end of the shaft. Turn the nut onto the threads by hand as far as it will go, then use a wrench to tighten it the rest of the way. Now flatten an ear of the lock washer into one of the grooves in the edge of the nut. Now that the bearings are in place, all that remains is to slide the bearing housing over the bearing assembly. This completes assembly of the rotor, but before setting the rotor into the casing, the casing has to be prepared. Use a stone dipped in oil or solvent to smooth the surface of the upper and lower casing flanges. And don't forget to stone the bearing pedestal.
It's important that the bearing housings fit evenly against the casing. Finally, with the rotor assembled and the casing prepared, you can set the rotor into the casing. Be careful not to bump the impeller against the casing, and be sure the casing wearing rings drop home into their proper grooves. To be certain the bearings and bearing housings are in right, rotate the shaft a couple of times. It should rotate smoothly. You can now replace the bearing housing shims. The marks you made earlier will ensure that you put them back in the right place. The holes in the shims should line up with the holes for the bearing housing bolt and the dowel pin. To hold the shims and the bearing housing in position, insert the bearing housing bolt into its hole. Then, lubricate the shaft of the dowel pin and set it into its hole to align the bearing housing. Follow the same procedure with the remaining sets of shims. Insert the shims, then the bearing housing bolt and the dowel pin. But remember not to tighten the bolts or the dowel pins until all four sets of shims and all four bolts and dowel pins are in place. Test the placement of the bearings by rotating the shaft. Again, it should rotate freely without friction or drag. Now measure the distance from the impeller to the wall of the casing. The measurements on both sides of the impeller should be identical. If the measurements are not the same, the impeller must be moved. First, loosen the impeller retaining nut on the side toward which the impeller must be moved and back it away from the impeller. Then turn the other nut in the direction of the impeller. This retaining nut will move the impeller for you. Check the position of the impeller as many times as necessary while making adjustments to center the impeller in the casing. When your measurements match, Retighten the retaining nuts and set screws. You can see why the set screws are left for last. They should not be tightened until you're certain that the parts of the rotor are properly aligned. With everything tightened down, check again to see that the rotor still turns. New gaskets can now be set in place on the casing flanges. And the flingers and lantern rings moved back against the bearing housings. Setting the upper casing half into position requires special care. The casing must be lowered over the rotor in such a way that it doesn't bump and damage the impeller. Also, the witness marks on the casing halves must match to ensure that the upper half is properly aligned. If the casing is equipped with dowel pins, these should be installed, tapped into place if necessary, before the casing flange bolts are added. Then each of the casing bolts is lubricated and set into place. Also, remember that the gland follower bolts must be inserted into the ends of the casing before you position the flange bolts that hold them in place. You can use a speed wrench to tighten the flange bolts, but no matter what tool you use, always tighten the bolts in opposition to one another. First, tighten a bolt on one side of the casing then, tighten the bolt opposite it on the other side of the casing. This ensures an even pressure between the casing flanges. Some manufacturers 
require that the casing flange bolts be tightened with a specific amount of pressure or torque. If this is true of the pump you're overhauling, check the manufacturer's instruction manual for the proper torque value. Finally, with the casing halves bolted together, tighten the set screws in the flingers. Basically, that completes the reassembly process, except for packing the stuffing boxes and attaching the gland followers. We'll see the details of the packing procedure in the next segment. You'll also notice that we didn't replace the coupling hub on the shaft. This is because the pump is being stored instead of being returned to service. If it were being put into service, we'd replace the hub on the end of the shaft so that the pump could be connected to its motor. We've covered a lot of material in this segment, so before going on to packing procedures, let's take a short break. When a pump is leaking as much as this one is, you know that something's wrong. If tightening the gland follower doesn't help and water keeps pouring out of the gland, the pump probably needs repacking. The first step in repacking is to have the pump shut down and tagged out. Next, get together all the tools you'll need and take them with you to the work site. To make loosening the gland follower bolts easier, Spray the bolts with penetrating oil. The oil will dissolve any rust or corrosion that has built up. Then use a wrench to loosen the bolts and back them off far enough so you can swing them out of the way. You can now remove the gland follower itself. Pull it back toward you until it's free of the stuffing box. Then separate and remove the two halves. A packing puller makes removing old packing material a lot easier. Notice that the tip of the packing puller is shaped like a corkscrew. Turning the handle will drive the corkscrew tip into the packing. Then when you pull it toward you, the packing will come with it. Remove the packing and set it aside. Repeat this procedure for each ring of packing, outboard of the lantern ring. Be careful not to pull too hard or you may rip the packing and complicate the job of getting it out of the stuffing box. When you can feel that there's no more packing in front of the lantern ring, Use one or more pieces of stiff wire with a hook on one end to remove the lantern ring from the stuffing box. Reach into the stuffing box with the wires and insert the hooks into the holes in the sides of the ring. It might take a few tries. But once you get the lantern ring hooked, you can carefully work it toward you. With a little coaxing, the ring will eventually slide out of the stuffing box. When it's free, pull the ring back out of the way against the flinger and the bearing housing. With the lantern ring out of the way, the rest of the packing will be exposed. Remove it using the packing puller as we saw before. Again, be careful not to tear the packing. When the last ring of old packing has been removed, use a flashlight to be sure you've gotten all traces of packing material out of the stuffing box. Then, wipe the shaft to remove any dirt or excess water. This is important because the next step is to determine the size of the new packing you need. Measuring the distance from the shaft to the edge of the casing will tell you what diameter of new packing you need. A second important measurement to take is the diameter of the shaft. 
This will tell you what size mandrel you need to cut the new packing. Write down both measurements, the distance between the shaft and the casing, and the diameter of the shaft. One easy method for accurately cutting new packing rings is to use a mandrel, a length of old shaft or piping whose diameter is the same as that of the pump shaft that you just measured. It's also important that you measure the new packing to be sure it will fit perfectly into the space between the casing and the shaft. Use only the type of packing recommended by the manufacturer. Using one of the old rings of packing as a guide, measure off how much new packing to cut from the spool. If you've removed five old rings from the pump, as we have here, be sure to measure a length of packing at least equal to the length of five rings. It helps to give yourself a little extra. Lay the packing across a wooden block and cut off the measured length. The wood provides a soft cutting surface that won't damage the blade. Start wrapping the length of new packing around the mandrel. Wrap it around once for each ring of packing you need. In our case, we need five rings, although remember, a little extra is a lot better than not enough. Keep the packing fairly tight as you're wrapping. Then, when you've formed the number of rings you need, tighten the packing around the mandrel once more and make a single cut through all the rings. Cut straight down. This ensures that the ends of each ring will fit evenly against each other inside the stuffing box. With the new rings cut, you can begin the actual repacking procedure. First, lubricate the shaft. This will help the packing ring slide smoothly into the stuffing box. Also, lubricate the inside and outside diameter of the packing ring. Then slide this first packing ring into the stuffing box. Do the same for the second ring. Lubricate on both sides. This lubrication will prevent excessive wear during the break-in period. When the ring has been lubricated, slide it into the stuffing box. One thing to remember here, always stagger the open ends of the rings like this at 90 degree angles to one another. This breaks up the flow path of the leak off. If you arrange the open ends in a straight line, you give the sealing water an easy path and the gland will end up leaking too much. When the first rings of packing are in position and properly staggered, lubricate the outside of the lantern ring. Then slide it as far as you can into the stuffing box. You can now lubricate and install the remaining new packing rings outboard of the lantern ring. When the last ring is in position, reassemble the gland follower on the shaft. When you have both halves fitted together, use the follower to push the packing rings and the lantern ring into the stuffing box. Then swing the gland follower bolts into position, fastening the gland follower in place. Now tighten the bolts enough to press the packing and the lantern ring firmly into the stuffing box. 
Don't over tighten these bolts, however. The gland follower must be loose enough to allow water to flow through the gland and lubricate the new packing. When the gland follower is in place, open the valve on the gland sealing line. This will allow water to flood the stuffing box. This leak off is an indication that the lantern ring lines up correctly with the gland sealing line. After allowing a few minutes for the water to thoroughly wet the new packing material, tighten the gland follower so that when the pump is turned on, the water won't spray all over you. Now you can have the pump turned on so you can make final adjustments to the gland follower. With the pump running, check the temperature of the stuffing box. If it feels not just warm but hot, loosen the gland follower and increase the leak off until the stuffing box cools off. Adjusting the gland follower is the real art of packing a pump. You don't want the leak off to be excessive, but at the same time, you can't have the new packing heating up and damaging the shaft. As a result, it will probably take you several tries over a long period of time to get the gland follower properly adjusted and the new packing properly broken in. When you finally have the gland follower adjusted so that the leak off rate and the temperature of the stuffing box are holding steady, have your supervisor or whoever is designated by your plant's policy inspect the job. Is OK completes the job. That covers the basic procedure for repacking a centrifugal pump. Your text lists additional hints that are good to know and that will make the job a bit easier. Still, the best teacher is experience. Pay particular attention to any additional notes your instructor might give you. Your instructor's experience and the experience of the maintenance mechanics you'll be working with will add a lot to the knowledge you've gained in this unit.